Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring, the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Joining me in center ring today is a friend of mine. Her name is Leslie Fabian. Leslie is a retired licensed social worker, which is important in this discussion to a certain extent. She's also an author, and this is how I met Leslie, and this is going to be part of the topic of the show today. Leslie's book is titled, My Husband's a Woman Now. And in this world of sexual freedom, gender re-identification, the book that was actually published in 2014 kind of predated everything we've all been living through in the United States with gender and sexuality. And Leslie's story must be heard. And that's why I brought her to the show. So Leslie, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, this is going to be super great. (laughs) Very first thing up is Leslie was divorced. And although it was many years ago, what did you say, Leslie, 1981? 40 years. 40 years ago. I was very young. (laughs) And how many children did you have? We had two. Okay. And they're now, yeah, 49 and 46. Oh, my. (laughs) I know. It's unbelievable. But their children can almost be having children. Are you a great-grandmother yet? No, I'm great grandmother age, but our kids all waited a long time to start reproducing. So we have little grandchildren, three years and under. All right. Well, quite a challenge for those of us that are up in years. <laughs> yes, indeed. To keep up. But because this is a podcast devoted to amicable divorces, I like to do what I call exit interviews, Leslie, people looking back on their divorce. Um, in a healthy way to really explain what the challenges were going into the the divorce, which means transitioning out of the marriage, what were those challenges? And as a look back, what are you proud of that you did, how you handled yourself, and what might you have done differently if there's anything you would have done differently? So can you take us through just a little bit of the journey, why you chose to be divorced? Well, first of all, when we were married, I was 20 years old, and my former husband was 21. We were still in college, and um, who knew what we were doing at that age? (laughs) But we were crazy about each other, and it seemed like the natural thing to do. Uh, And actually, out of the 12 years that we were married, I believed that we had a really wonderful marriage. Um, We, he graduated from college, and we moved quite a lot. in fact, about 14 times in the first 10 years, including moves from upper state New York where he was in college and Pennsylvania and back and forth. Um, And we had two children along the way and we lived in multiple places. And basically what happened is that I feel that I grew up in those first 10 years. I I turned 30. Um, I had moved with him over and over again, and I'd learned a lot about what he was and wasn't interested in in our marriage. He did not have much interest in our children. He was very interested in me, so in that way, it was nice for my ego. But when he, he traveled in his work, and then when he came home, he wanted to be with me. He wanted to go sailing and play golf, which we did, and uh, go out for dinner and do all sorts of things with his date. <laughs> Uh, but we had two children. So uh, a lack of interest in the children was a huge component near the end. I mean, I think I was in denial. Well, denial is sometimes a good thing. I think in a way I was in (laughs) denial. Yeah, I think in some ways I was in denial, uh, but I was very young and I was crazy about him and I was devoted to him. And I was born in 1949. So my training was to be the good wife and so on. Thank God I... um, started turning things around. And so um, I would not, uh, if I had it to do over again, I would still do that. He was a drinker uh, and that's how he dealt with the divorce. When I finally said, I can't do this anymore. I I tried for two years to get him to go and see someone with me 
and saying what I thought were sensible things such as, but if you have a legal problem, you go to a lawyer. And if you have a financial problem, you go to a financial planner or an accountant. Um, If you have a marital problem or issues, you go to a therapist and he wouldn't do that. And uh, so I spent, I, I guess I moved pretty quickly because it was two years of trying everything I could think of and finally saying, okay, I deserve better than this. And I think that's part of what happened in those 12 years. It was um, 12 years when we, when we finally split up. Um, when I you, when grew you, up and started feeling better about me and what I deserved in my life. Well, now that's interesting to me because... If you say that he was really interested in you, but not so much the children, during those two years that you wanted to readjust the relationship, did he continue to show that interest in you as if you were dating? You even used that as a reference? To some degree, although I was so unhappy and becoming more and more so, and and basically in a transition that I recognized somewhere during those two years that, um, okay, if this keeps going this way, I'm not going to stay with him. And um, he still wanted to do things with me. Part of it, Judy, was that I looked the way he wanted a wife to look. I was blonde. I was uh, good looking. Um, I um, still are. Oh, thank you. In a different way. (laughs) In an appropriate way, I hope. Very Um, much so. Thank you. Um, He would come home from his trips, his his business trips, with a new piece of gorgeous jewelry. Or uh, there were fur coats and Mm -hmm. there was, uh, as I said, jewelry. There might be a gorgeous nightgown or peignoir set. He, He lavished gifts on me. And what I realized near the end of our marriage, (laughs) this is kind of amusing in a way, very sad, I think. He said to me one day when we were arguing and I was saying, I I just can't keep going on with this. You're destroying the image I've worked so hard to create. And that was one of the last straws, Judy. I'll tell you, when I began to realize, okay, this man to whom I've, this young man at that point, (laughs) to whom I've devoted 12 years of my life and moved 14 times and with whom I've had two children, uh, thinks of me as an image that um, he wants to project. And so that's why, I mean, I, I gave up a lot monetarily when I ended the marriage because I, I had married into a wealthy family and he earned quite a bit of money and his family gifted us with money annually, his grandparents. And, um, and I just decided that my authenticity and my happiness and my uh, appreciation of life and my desire to grow as a human being um, were greater than my need to stay in this secure marriage. God, that was so well said. Um, but it, it, the, the sentence you said, it, and it came from him, right? Um, you're destroying the image I've worked so hard to create. He he said that to you? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That was when I began to realize his lack of, of depth, really. You know, that. Okay. So, in this marriage, I'm finding this fascinating now. In <laughs> this marriage, he lavished gifts on you. He wanted to spend time with you, not so much with the kids. And you were now in your early 30s and, and, and growing differently. Mm-hmm. So is the lesson out of this, it's not so much where you live and what you have, and I guess, I don't know how to put this, but he had an interest in you, except you were a different person than he thought you were. Is it something like that? You had grown to be different than the person he thought he had, and I guess groomed. <laughs> well, he liked the package when he first met me. I mean, and, and I liked the package that he presented and his whole family. And our families became social right away quickly and after our meeting and established a, a connection. And just the whole package of the two families and the summer homes and the 
the grandparent, his grandparents, just in my, they were like grandparents to me, a great aunt and uncle. And I was at their summer home when I met him. Um, so, and I was 18 and he was 19 when we met. So mm. we, I mean, when I look back on that, Judy, and compare who I was as an 18 year old when I met him and what I realized I wanted in my life and in terms of values and what's important and so on. And I I had also said to him at one point near the end of our marriage, or he, he said something about, let me think a sec. I had said, look, I want to get my degree. I stopped college when we got married to support us while he finished. And I went back to school and wanted to get my degree. And I said, when I get my degree, what I'd like to do for you is let you take a year off. And I'd like to support us. And and you can see what it's like to be home with the kids and have more freedom. And yeah. And his response to that was, that's great. I could get an MBA then. And then I'd make real mega bucks. His entire focus seemed to be that package, that that, um, image that he had quote, worked so hard to create, end quote. Um, it, it just, it, it, things mounted up over the years. And I thought, we have very different values. You know, he, he didn't seem interested in uh, establishing a home in a certain place with our children and staying there long enough to make friends and keep our kids in their schools and those kinds of things. It was far more to him about a better job, more money, bigger cars, more club memberships, better club, you know, the whole physical manifestation of wealth, let's say. So I don't object to wealth in any way. I'm not against wealth. Nor do I. I'm volunteering for wealth right now. (laughs) But uh, it just, that was not the primary thing anymore. The package, the, the image to me, yes, I liked it too in the beginning and for the first 10 years. And then I began to realize there's, there has to be more. Okay, and so what else is interesting to me is the moving. So, and I wasn't connecting it until you just said, well, the kids. I mean, moving affects kids. We've heard military kids talk about mm-hmm. what their life was like when their parents or parent, you know, was reassigned constantly. But moving for jobs, I get a move for a job to better yourself, but that's a lot of moves. What, how mm-hmm. many moves did you say? 14? Well, remember, the first, in the first two and a half years after our marriage, he was finishing college. And so we would be up at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York for the uh, school year. And then we'd go down to Pennsylvania where there was family. And then we'd go back to school in a second apartment. And be- so I'm counting all of those. But okay. we, after he graduated, we moved to Williamsport, Pennsylvania rented a house, then bought a house there. Then he changed jobs and we moved to Atlanta, bought a house there. Then he changed jobs and needed to go to Albany, New York for training. And then, uh, and I, we had a two and a half year old and I was seven months pregnant when we moved from Atlanta to Albany. Um, And then Stuart, our younger child was born. And uh, when he was a month old, the new company told Sandy he was ready for a sales territory and we were moving to Richmond, Virginia. So we went to Richmond and we rented a house and then we bought a house. And then uh, trying to think what happened with that job. I don't know. He, he, he left that job, I think. And he was hired by a company in Ohio. So we moved to Springfield, Ohio and bought a house. And then two years later, he actually lost that job. I think that was the first time that his drinking was catching up with him because he was in sales and he'd sold one of the largest, uh, made one of the largest sales in the company's history. And um, so he knew how to sell, but it's almost as if it's such a cliche, Judy, the traveling salesman with the bottle, you know? <laughs> it is, isn't it? And, yeah. and I learned that there are people who are um, functional alcoholics. Oh, yes. They can and drink and still work, which is... Um, just misleading. And mm-hmm. those people are very difficult to reach. You have a problem. No, I don't. What kind of problem do I have? I go to work every day. I make money. What's exactly. the problem? But, you know, the problem is you're, you're um, increasing your ability to consume alcohol and physically it destroys you. Internally, mm-hmm. it destroys you, your organs and everything else. He okay. did ultimately die of a heart attack after the doctor told him to stop drinking or it would kill him when he was 
59. Wow. Yeah. And in the meantime, had two more wives, two more divorces, and was engaged to another woman between wives two and three. So he just, he was an unhappy man. Uh, Leslie, just a quick look back on the divorce process. Was it difficult? How oh, hell did it yeah. work for you? <laughs> it, because as I said, he, he saw it as something that I was doing to him. Mm. And fortunately, for some reason, I was able to realize that if that's the way you need to see it, okay. Yes, I am saying enough. I'm not doing this anymore. He took no responsibility whatsoever for the demise of our marriage. And as I said, he told me I was destroying the image he'd worked so hard to create. So right. that's the bottom line. Um, it was very difficult in that he was so into blaming me for the demise of our marriage. And our children were only nine and six at that time. So we have these two little children, and I'm trying to do the best that I can for them while their parents are marriage is falling apart. Um, it's been so long, Judy, and it's hard to look back on that now and think how I would do it differently if I had the wisdom and experience that I now have. It. I'm 72 now um, to go back and go. The point is I wouldn't have been married to a man like him at this stage of my life. And in right. fact, I was single between marriages for 10 years and would not have married again. And maybe we'll get into that had right. I not found a certain kind of man, <laughs> which, right. was, which uh, I can chuckle about now. Uh, no, this is, this, is, <laughs> this is one of the best stories I've ever heard. Oh. So the one thing then I want to leave the divorce experience with is you compromised in terms of saying, okay, yes, I'm doing this to you. If this is the way you need to frame it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this to you. Now let's do what we have to do to get divorced. Right. And what I tell my clients all the time is divorce is a compromise. There's divorce law. And then there's what does it take to get out of this with mm -hmm. as least amount, with the least amount of damage possible. Mm -hmm. And that's where the compromise is. Um, you can't make compromises that are detrimental to you, but you made it, I think you made a good compromise. If that's the way you want to look at it, let's look at it that way. I agree. I'm doing this. I'm initiating it. Mm -hmm. Let's just get through it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a victim stance versus a, a stance of saying, I need to take control of my life and make decisions about it that are the best they can be for myself and my children. Now, I will also say that through the years following our divorce, <clears throat> and I probably would even say this today with my 46-year-old son and my 49-year-old daughter, I think it may have been the best possible thing for my daughter, Brady, because uh, perhaps because she reminded him so much of me and he was so angry with me. In fact, that was another interesting aspect of it. I think he took out a lot of his anger about what I was, quote, doing to him and, quote, on our daughter. Uh -huh. And then with Stu, our son, who was only six at the time, and Brady was only nine. I mean, they were really quite young. Um, I think it may have been the opposite because their dad chose to take a job in Atlanta at that point. And I stayed in Massachusetts with the kids and he went down to Georgia and saw the kids very little. You know, it got to be once a year or if he was nearby on a business trip. So um, I, I think for our son, for whatever reason, because even though dad was a pretty crappy dad, <laughs> to be blunt, I think it was really devastating to, to Stuart, to our son. Whereas I think, and, it, it, and I'm not saying it was easy for Brady, but she had me and we were a lot alike and Stu lost his dad. And, and dad had never been very good at all with Brady, especially. It was sort of the typical, well, this is my son kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think we were an anachronism of some sort, except that this, we're talking 40 to 50 years ago. I know. And I think I when you compare today to, to that long ago, it's very different. <laughs> very much so. I agree. Okay, now let's flash forward <laughs> to okay. your second marriage. One of the most fascinating stories ever. So how did you meet 
David Fabian. That's first. Okay. Who then became Deborah Fabian. Okay. As I said, I was single for 10 years between my marriages and I would not have remarried. I don't believe that I would have remarried had I not found a man who was as introspective and desirous of growth and change, internal growth, I mean, and and change and a spiritual focus, not religious, but spiritual uh, as, as I had because I'd had a marriage already in which I was changing and growing and I was not interested in being married to someone else who, um, who wasn't desirous of that same kind of change. Um, I was in a women's group at the time with, um, in the Boston area and we called it the women's floating circle. And each month the hostess that was floating cause we moved from one house to the next each month we were at a different woman's home um, the hostess would have a topic. And so for the gathering, the holiday gathering of 1987, the topic was transgenderism because the woman who had started the group, Neela Miller, um, specialized in working with transgender individuals. And you now, were working as a licensed social worker at no, the time. No. <laughs> well, why were you part, Leslie, I thought you were, why were you part of that group then? Well, it was not a, a professional group. It was a, a friends group. Oh. And many of the women in it were psychotherapists. Some had our own businesses. I had not gone to graduate school at that point. I was raising two children. Mm-hmm. I had gotten my undergraduate degree at age 35. Um, magna cum laude, I'll add. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and, uh, I wanted to become a therapist eventually, but at that point, going to graduate school was out of the question. You know, I was trying to raise these two children and their father was doing everything he could to send me as little as possible. Um, And uh, so I needed to be working. But I met Neela in kind of an odd way, and I won't go into it now, but she and I saw each other a, a second time and she said, I'm starting a women's group. Would you like to be part of it? So that's how the women's group started. And it was fascinating because the hostess always had some really fine topic and we would think about it in the month in between gatherings so that when we came together, we could talk about how it was in our own lives, that particular topic. It might be money. It might be relationships with our parents, relationships with children, just all kinds of whatever the hostess came up with. So Neela's for the holiday gathering of 1987. I think at that point we'd been meeting maybe two years. I think we started in 85 she said, okay, I have uh, a friend coming who's a photographer from New York and she's been photographing trans people. Mm, I'm trying to think whether it was all men. Uh, But anyway, she'd been photographing trans people for 10 years and she's about to publish a beautiful book and she's published three now, I think at this point. Her name is Mariette Pathy Allen in case anyone's interested. Um, And uh, Mariette was coming to talk about but making these photographs through the years. And then we were extending, Neela extended our timing uh, to six hours. We usually met for four hours. So we had time to eat. We had a potluck, eat and schmooze, and then explore the topic for another couple of hours. And so Neela extended it and said, and I have four clients coming or former clients coming for dessert and coffee, and they're going to talk to you. And you can ask them anything you want, and they have the right to say, I'm not going to answer that. And no one ever did. So in they came and um, David Fabian wearing a purple dress and a jewel tone scarf and (laughs) heels and um, stockings and and a big old wig because it was the 80s and we were all wearing our big hair. Um, And she was one of the transgender people. And I say she because when a trans person is dressed as a certain gender, male or female, you refer to the person by the gender that's Presented. Expressing itself. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. I knew that Deborah was a man, obviously. I liked the way that she uh, shared herself with us, himself, herself with us, answered all the questions, um, talked about the uh, state of his marriage, which was really bad. I mean, that was one of the downsides of the whole thing. He was married and he had four young kids. Uh, and I had always said I could never be the other woman. I'm not sure how detailed you want me to get, Judy, but at any rate, we were just very much attracted to each other. 
despite the fact that he was sitting there, the six foot, uh, almost six foot one inch man in his purple dress, her purple dress. And the pronouns, by the way, are insane. I mean, when I try to talk now, we were married, I'm jumping forward, but eventually we were married for 20 years when David transitioned and came out full time as Deborah. And so when I talk now about the past, I mean, David, Deborah was a man for 62 years. So it's very hard to talk about my marriage to David without saying he, except that now he's a she and blah, blah, blah. So it's crazy making. So that's how we met. And then the following month, um, we saw each other again at a workshop that Neela was offering. She was a, an, she's an outstanding psychotherapist and um, artist and composer, and she just does everything, practically everything. So we had entered um, a workshop with her that was going to meet once a month for five months called The Living Soul with Jungian dream work and all kinds of wonderful things. And there was David. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that's Deborah. And I like him as a man even better. Well, wait so, a minute. When when um, Deborah back yeah. then in the first oh. meeting introduced herself dressed as a woman, did she introduce herself as Deborah? Is that the name she gave herself way back then at the first meeting? I think someone had told her somewhere along the line, "Why don't you call yourself Debbie?" It's another D name, <clears throat> right? Me. And she liked it. Um, remember that this was a learning opportunity and the presentation was all about enabling us to ask questions and learn about this phenomenon of transgenderism. Excuse me. And so all of the women in the group were well aware that each of these, they were all what we used to call male to female transgender people. And the reason I say used to call is that the terminology changes all the time and it's very hard to keep up with it. I mean, we're, we're not supposed to say transsexual anymore, I guess. Um, I, oh, I haven't heard that, but Oh, okay. well, it's all transgender now, which we used as an umbrella for everything, but I, I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> all right, yes. <laughs> um, so we knew that Deborah was a man and that the other three people uh, attending were also, either had been, because one was a post-operative, what we called a transsexual at the time, um, woman. Uh, And one was just a very androgynous man, had very long hair and liked wearing an article or two of women's clothing, but did not necessarily want to represent himself as she, just was androgynous. Uh, And then I think there was one, and then there were two who were cross-dressers. And that included David slash Deborah who believed at the time that um, I like to wear women's clothes. If I had a choice, I'd live life as a woman, but that's not going to happen. And um, so it just was, uh, I was just really intrigued. And I was attracted to this person, not because of what he or she was wearing or how uh, the physical presentation was, but because I loved the honesty. I loved the risk-taking Uh, This was the first time David had ever gone anywhere in public other than sneaking around once in a while out in the car. Um, First time he had ever gone out. See, this is when the pronoun trouble comes along. I know, I understand. uh, So he he had never gone dressed anywhere and talked with other people other than Neela. And so Neela, Neela knew that having Deborah be a part of this, David and Deborah be a part of this, um, this day with the women's group would be really healthy and helpful to furthering his acceptance of this part of himself. So at this point, and this is what my memory is about this story when you and I met back in 2012, 2013, mm. um, that, that David was a cross-dresser at the time, but that's, well, that's what he it went. That's what he believed. Mm-hmm. And, and so, of course, I believed that as well. And, and it, he truly believed it. I don't think it was a denial thing. I, I, as I said, he would occasionally say, if I had my choice, I would, I would love to live as a woman. However, I'm a man. I'm a father of four. I'm a husband. I'm an, Deborah is an orthopedic surgeon. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have patients. I have a practice. 
I have people that probably can never know about this. Uh, although we had many friends who did know about the dre- the cross dressing and were very kind and generous and supportive of that. Um, we did a lot of personal growth work together, a lot of the insight seminars, which is personal growth work. Okay, that's where I wanted to, to start talking about too. So Oprah used to have Harville Hendricks on her show a lot. That's where I had heard that name previous to meeting you. And then I think she brought on Harville and his wife because mm-hmm. they work together, right? Yes. So talk about, because this was a very influential, these were very influential people in your journey with now Deborah to not only define the relationship you both wanted to have at the very beginning of the relationship, but I'm assuming you have been defining all along the relationship. You keep, you know, making sure it's in shape. Would you please explain what these workshops were designed to do and why you both wanted them? Well, I have a desire to be the best human being that I can be. And my own authenticity and happiness are uh, primary to my living and my life. That's why I said earlier, I would not have married again had it not been someone who was as interested in personal growth and expansion as I am. Um, The fact that David came dressed to Neela's women's group gathering was a huge indication of this person's desire to grow and expand and accept herself, him, herself. Um, And then, of course, the workshop that we both showed up in the following month that went on for five months was all about, uh, well, as I said, Jungian dream work, and um, we did art projects that were about expressing who we are and dream work and uh, all kinds of things such as that. Uh, and then, and remember, I also said that when I met David, he was still married and had four young kids. Mine by that time were teenagers, young teenagers. Um, so we went through seven months of seeing each other occasionally and not being lovers and knowing we wanted to be together. But he, for seven months, was unable to leave the marriage because of the kind of person that he is. She is, he is, and she is. <laughs> Um, he wouldn't simply walk away from a 17-year marriage. And I, I mean, this was another growth point for us, Judy. I knew that I was not going to be the other woman and that the limit, there was going to be a limit of some kind to how long I'd be willing to even to see him, to meet for lunch or a walk in in the, you know, a walk or just any way of getting together. I knew there would come a time when I would need to be backing away. So, um, What happened is that I had done the Insight Seminar, which is all about being the best that we can be, loving ourselves first so that we can then love and care for others, Um, doing whatever we can to be, to to heal the wounds from early life, to to self-examine and uh, and discover the ways of uh, continuing to heal and grow throughout a lifetime. That's what I got out of Insight. I wanted... David to to do insight and uh, two years later in eighty eight we met in eighty seven I did it in eighty six insight one and then he did it in the summer of nineteen eighty eight and I frankly think that's what enabled him to leave his first marriage because oh, th- there's so much I could say Judy but basically David grew up in a household where uh, life wasn't supposed to be fun and uh, you just kind of kept to yourself and that sort of thing. So he does this seminar then where people are just all full of loving and joy and celebration at the healing and the growth that goes on. And uh, very soon after that, he did leave his first marriage. Uh, it, so isn't we, it great? Now, hold on a minute. Isn't okay. it great that he did that on his own oh, yeah. through <laughs> his own journey of self-discovery and not because you gave the ultimatum and and not because that's the only reason ultimatum. I'm sure you shared, look, there's only so far I can go. Mm -hmm. My commitment is never to be the other woman. I haven't heard you yet say the ultimatum. And so I'm assuming his decision was made on his own, not through you forcing it. 
That's exactly what I said to him during those seven months, Judy, over and over and over again. Do not leave her for me. I don't come with a guarantee. So do not leave her for me. You need to do this for you. And believe me, toward the end of that time, I was backing way away. And he had done insight. And then I went away to with one of my kids for a vacation and didn't tell him. I said, I'm not telling you where I'm going. And we didn't have cell phones then. So um, he actually left her while I was away. Was de- He had said to me, if I ever... <laughs> This is going to make me cry. If I ever leave her, I will be on your doorstep. And so he left her while I was gone. And then he needed to find me. And we were living in Massachusetts and I was in Pennsylvania. So he called my mother in Tampa, which is my hometown. He figured out how to get in touch with my mother and say, where is Leslie? And uh, she told him the general vicinity. And then he came looking for me and he totaled his car on the way and called me. Yeah, he didn't get hurt. <clears throat> He said, I'm in a hotel in New York and I've totaled my car, but I'm going to rent a car and I'll be there tomorrow. Aww. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy story. Oh my God, it's so cinematic. <laughs> it is, it is. That's why I keep thinking, when is somebody going to pick up my book and <laughs> make it into a movie? As and they anyways. should, and we will get to that, as <laughs> okay. they should. So am I answering the question, Judy? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, uh, no, I you're know. doing a great job. Okay. Great job, Leslie. After he left her, I he already knew, and I'm just going to say he, because it was still David then. He already knew that if I were ever to marry again, it would be to someone who was as interested in, in all of these things I've been talking about as I was. And that includes taking care of the relationship. Meaning we, we're not going to have the kinds of marriages we each had the first time around when we were 20 to 22 years old. Um, we'll have a commitment to to this marriage such that if one of us is having a problem, the other one will be involved in helping to resolve it, which to me is the essence of a relationship. You know, it's, um, okay, if you're unhappy, then I'm not going to say, well, I'm unhappy too, but it's more like, if you're unhappy and I can help, let me know how to help you. And if that means talking to someone... That is so healthy. If you're unhappy and I can help. Yes. Not, Not oh, I can fix that for you. Here's what to do. But still the the responsibility is on the person having a problem or. Yeah. Talking about it in such ways that the other person can be involved in a helpful way. And that if we need help, Remember, I told you about how I'd say to the first husband, a lawyer or a, an accountant or whatever, um, we would get the help. And boy, we did through the years, let me tell you. Because remember, there were six children involved at this point. Combined, um, the blended families. Yes. So we were married in 91. Two of, I'm going to say David again, because that's who it was at the time. Two of David's children didn't even come to the wedding because they had a soccer tournament that weekend and their mother was not the kind of person to say, I mean, she'll go to her grave probably blaming me for destroying her marriage and that's her choice and I'm sorry for that, but there's nothing I can do about that. Um, I don't recommend it, by the way, but life happens sometimes in unexpected ways. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. We both read Harville Hendricks' book, um, Getting the Love You Want, which is the one for couples. And it's an amazing book. It's been out for at least, well, over 30 years now because we've been married 30 years. And we both read it. There's also uh, Keeping the Love You Find, which is for single people. And it's all about healing. For I won't speak about the one for individuals because they're slightly different in that the one for couples is about the realization that in Harville Hendricks belief and many, many others beliefs, um, a relationship is about the healing and the growth that, that the relationship itself can provide for each individual as well as for the couple. So Harville Hendricks talks about the imago, which is the image that was created early in life about the way life is supposed to be, and that's in quotes, supposed to be. 
but we all have it. It's, you know, we grow up in families where we're trained in certain ways. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it has a lot to do with what attracts us to each other in the first place, matching imagos. Um, right. And we're not just talking about the physical attraction. This is what I think oh, is yes. extremely important mm-hmm. in what you're going to say and what you learned, because mm-hmm. it actually factored into the fact that you're still now with Deborah. Exactly. Keep going. Um, well, because we've done so much work on this marriage throughout the years, we've done um, Imago um, workshops. I do, David and I never did one together with Harville Hendricks, but he has um, therapists who were trained in his methods, Imago therapists. And we were in the Boston area, so we had had access to practically everything. We did, I believe, three workshops with a couple who did Imago relationship workshops. And it's a wonderful way to work uh, through relationship issues because you do it with maybe you know, there were generally, I think, maybe 20 couples, 15 to 20 couples with, um, it was the, their names, name was Welpton, this couple in the Boston area, uh, who did it together. So you'd have a couple who'd been married for 30 years or whatever they'd been married. And then you have maybe 20 couples or maybe it was 10 couples. I don't know, 20 people, 20 to 40 people, let's say. And they have books uh, with exercises in them, work, workbooks. And you sit together as a couple and you work through the, the uh, exercises in the book. And then everyone comes back and uh, would anyone like to talk about that? And, and then the Weltons themselves would demonstrate various um, exercises for working through things. And then people, sometimes a, another couple might come up and talk about what they went through. So one thing about, I would say this is one of the great beauties of work in a group. And I'm referring now to the Insight Seminar. I'm referring to these Imago workshops. The, one of the beauties is that we all, I think, we humans have a tendency to think that we're all alone with this horrible experience we have, these terrible feelings inside, this nasty stuff that goes on in our relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And you get into a workshop or one gets into or a couple gets into a workshop And you begin to notice that other people have the same kinds of issues. And here's how we can help you resolve it, folks. So we did loads of that through the years. We even went to, we read about someone in Time Magazine one year. I mean, as you can imagine, there were huge challenges with children. When we married in in, uh, um, 91, mine were 19 and 16, and David's were 15, 11, 8, and 4, so believe me, in the first few ma- ma- years of our marriage, I would think to myself, oh my God, what have I done? Because it was so complicated. And they were just a couple towns away, which in New England is nearby. And David, unlike my great irony in my life, Judy, the first husband had so little interest in our children. The second husband wanted to be there for everything these kids did. And that became an issue for us. I mean, I loved that he was so devoted to his family and his children. But, you know, having a little time alone together was, was pretty important, too. So we uh, read about a woman in Time magazine named Patricia Papper now, whose specialty, and she was in the Boston area, what specialty was um, step families. And we went to see her a couple of times because there were just some things we could not work through ourselves. So one of the great things about our marriage is that, and this has always existed in our marriage, if we have a problem and we need help, we get the help. I love that. I I, I truly, truly love that. Mm. This begs the question, what is a marriage? So I love the fact that you, you were insightful And we're defining reasons why you should be married and wanting to get to know each other well before you got married. And then throughout the marriage, you're constantly fine tuning through going to seminars, learning, reading, um, getting the professional help that is necessary to keep the relationship healthy and vibrant. And with that is the conscious commitment 
to to support the marriage through education, through redefining. And it, 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 again, it, it gets into the heart of who the human being is. And for me, I always looked at you as both you and your spouse um, as marrying the deepest part of yourselves, joining the deepest part of yourselves that everybody wants to get to as their goal. They don't even know how to say it sometimes. Did I say that right? Where your commitment was and, and why you, you spent time growing the marriage, growing the relationship. Well, to me, and I, I, I certainly can't speak for Deborah, but I would say this is probably true for both of us. There's a desire to, to have the best of everything in our lives. And so what could be more important than making sure that our relationship is working as well as it possibly can? Right. And that's what I couldn't have with the first guy. You know, that's what I began to realize that I wanted. But I love that I had 10 years between marriages of my own growth and self-discovery and healing. Because, and, and in fact, that's what he, the Hendrix book, uh, Keeping the Love You Find for Singles, is all about. It's about getting healthy so that you'll attract another healthy person in the first place. Okay, so this is also really important, what you just said, because we talk about this a lot in my practice as a mediator, but also on the show. And that is, if the tendency is to jump immediately into another relationship, which I find men do faster than women, um, you're not giving yourself the space and time to learn from the relationship that you just left. Absolutely. And to grow on your own so that the divorce rate in the United States is 50% of first marriages end in divorce, Mm. 60% of second marriages, and 70% of third marriages end in divorce. And I bet if I were to examine all of these second and third marriages, they happened rather quickly uh, after the divorce from the previous marriage. Mm -hmm. which means there's no time to reflect and grow Mm -hmm. and make different choices. And so I see when when I get repeat business (laughs) um, and I do get repeat business, the issues are the same. It's the Mm -hmm. same person they remarried, Mm -hmm. which means they haven't learned about themselves yet and how to make different choices for themselves. Mm But you. You, you did what I think was the healthiest. You grew on your own. So, again, what really is a marriage? What, what defines a healthy marriage? Well, all of the growth, all of the learning, all of the, okay, we have something to talk about. Let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. Let's not let it fester. Mm-hmm. Can we now, because we don't have eight hours, and we <laughs> need eight hours for this discussion, Can we fast forward now to when David said, the time has come. Well, that's not the way it happened, though, Judy. Could I make one comment about what you just said? Yeah. I think there's a danger in saying this is what a marriage is. This is Deborah's and my marriage, and it's the healthiest, happiest way for us to go. But one of the most important things we've learned through the years is that there are different kinds of relationships and marriages, different kinds of intimacy. Um, I mean, I can get into it a little bit, but you know, we don't have a sex life anymore because I happen to be heterosexual. Um, and some marriages do, don't, I suppose, have a sexual component and they're just great. Um, so I think we need to be careful in defining marriage and intimacy because there are so many different forms of intimacy. And some marriages work maybe because both people are less interested in personal growth and expo- you know, um, healing themselves. Maybe because they don't realize you know, that they have a great marriage because it's a lot of fun and then they travel and they do fun things or uh, some marriages you know, stay together 
because of the children. And I don't think that's particularly good, but I think there've been a lot of studies on the, the detrimental effects of divorce on children and the benefits of having two you know, parents stay together. Then you hear about the ones who say, well, we finally decided to split up and the kids said, why did you wait so long? You guys have been miserable for years. So I think it's just really important not to generalize too much about what a marriage is and so on. Quite uh, frankly, I, com- I completely agree. That's why I said, you know, it begs the question, what is a marriage? Well, that's you what I mean. Your marriage, <laughs> one way you looked at what worked for you and other people, your examples are great. Uh, have a different type of marriage, whatever works, works, but you must be conscious to a certain degree. But when, at when huge, when some huge shift comes up, now you're tested, right? Well, we were tested over and over and over again, Judy. All right. <laughs> With the kids and the ex-spouses, mine was still alive. You know, my first one too. And he was crazy. He spent all the kids' money that was supposed to be for college and so on, and then declared personal bankruptcy in the midst of my taking him to court over our children's money. Yeah. So anyway, bleh, that's all in the past. Um, let me um, let me just think a second. Okay. So I want people to know if they're interested in this story that through the first 20 years of our marriage, cross-dressing was a fairly big part of it. Not continuous by any means, but we would go away. We'd go out for dinner sometimes. We'd go into Boston. We were um, 25 miles outside of Boston. And so we felt safe going into Boston to certain restaurants. We had, we have and had a lot of trans friends because there's an annual event that we went to probably for 20 years when we lived in that area uh, in on Cape Cod that is the oldest transgender gathering um, in the country. And uh, so we knew a lot of people and we could meet friends in Boston and, um, and, or we'd go away for a weekend and David would dress part of the time perhaps. And then during this once a year event that was nine days long, um, David got to be Deborah all week. So I, I think it's important to note that through the years, I saw the devastation that he experienced after he'd had some time as Deborah and had to go back to being a guy an orthopedic surgeon. They happen to be the jocks of the surgical world. And let me also say that David was a jock. He played soccer in college and was a candidate for All-American soccer. And um, he was a pilot and a scuba diver and built things and just, a, it's, he's a, she, he, she is a very well-rounded individual because I would not have been attracted to an effeminate man. I think that's important. Um, I I do like masculine men and I really like men. Uh, And I really liked David. And I thought I was kind of, I think it's my adventuring spirit or whatever that um, thought this was kind of cool that once in a while this masculine man of mine would dress as a woman and we'd go out. But so through those first 20 years, I saw for almost 20 years, the, the sadness and the depression, really, and the difficulty. Because, I should also say this, there uh, was such an enormous component of self-judgment and shame and all of the things. Remember, we were born in 1949, Judy. So, through the, growing up in the 50s and 60s and then from the 60s until, you know, finally David did start transitioning, there was just society... <laughs> It was a very disparaging situation in so many ways. Right. So actually, the way David finally decided to begin a transition was after we'd come back, I think, from one of those forays to the Cape for a week. And I saw him just retreating into the sadness and the pain of giving up being Deborah. And at that point, all of our kids were grown and out of high school and some at most out of college um, or not going to college. And um, so we didn't have the, the obligation of the young children anymore. And I, I actually said one day after this event, do you want to be miserable for the rest of your life? 
because I saw such misery going on. And I'm so much about my own life being joyful and full of light and pleasure and fun and love and so on. I wanted that for my beloved as well. So I think, and I, I also want this to be known. Um, I mean, at first, David could hardly believe it. Do you mean this? And I said, look, it's time to look into it. And I don't know what it will mean for us, <laughs> is what I said. Wow. So he began the transition, and it was a two-year period before Deborah came out full-time. Uh, and um, for about the first year of those two years, uh, he would say, but I don't want to lose you. And I'd say, I cannot guarantee. Well, it took about a year and a half, I think, before I realized, okay, there isn't anybody else I want to be with. I want to be with you. I love you. And we have a wonderful marriage and we've worked our butts off to, to make it that way. Um, but for a while, each time I said something about that, he would say, I'll stop immediately if it means losing you. But my response to that was always, absolutely not. You have to do this for yourself. And I don't, you know, it's that old, I don't come with a guarantee. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you now how this is going to feel to me a year or two or five or 10 years from now. So as I said, it took about a year and a half. And then I realized, and actually we were doing another couples workshop. It wasn't an Imago workshop, but there's a couple in California who come um, and do a workshop every year at a conference center we loved in Western Massachusetts. And um, they were amazing. So we did a workshop with them. And um, during the transition, we did one. And I realized in there, because when we do this kind of work, the heart's open, you get back into all of the feelings that were there in the beginning. And you realize how precious this relationship and this other human being is, this soul that's joined with yours, as you so eloquently put it earlier. Um, so it was at one of those workshops where I said, you know what? <laughs> You're the person for me. <laughs> My. You know? So, and that was, as I have said, I think that was 10 years ago. So I had 20 years of marriage to David with occasional excursions into Deborah Hood. <laughs> and now I've had Deborah for the past 10 years. And that's been a huge challenge, too. I mean, we've been through job changes and discrimination and a discrimination lawsuit and moves and phew, craziness. So for me, the thing I love the most about your story with Deborah is that you consciously and continuously made the decision to be together. Mm -hmm. And even though this extreme change came into your relationship, one person changes uh, their gender expression. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to say that? That's of course. A that's good a way nice to say it. Their mm -hmm. gender expression, it didn't make you a lesbian, which you had to go through that whole trip. I mean, I know because I was uh, knew you. We were working on your book together. Mm -hmm. um, so just for, for you to have to do that and to reinforce, I'm not a lesbian. That doesn't make me a lesbian. I love this human being regardless of the package they're in. Mm -hmm. And does love get any better than that? I don't know. Does it? <laughs> I don't think it can. I mean, I, I kind of think that's the ultimate love. That mm. anything, I mean, listen, you could be married to somebody who is in a car accident and physically cripples them and they can't do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got to redefined. Okay, so how are we connected? So mm -hmm. so we can't make love together, so that, that doesn't exist. You can't work. That changes what I have to do now. Mm -hmm. If we need, you know, granted that we need money to live, it changes everything if something like that happens, a physical mm -hmm. change. Not every marriage survives that. No. No, but I'll tell you something, Judy. One of the things I said to Deb every time I said, I cannot tell you now what this will mean for us down the road is I will always love you and I always I will always support you in in you know I'll always be your best friend. I, there was no question about that. And that's one of the things that I wanted to uh present I guess in my book to other women uh, and it's not just women but uh, you know my own experiences as a woman being married to a trans a trans woman 
this all gets so confusing but because it used to be that David was a trans man who wanted to be a woman. But again, this is all terminology changes again. So at any rate, <coughs> I know it's crazy. Um, well, I forgot what I was saying. But underneath <laughs> the exterior is the soul, is the human being, undefined by gender. And, mm -hmm. and for me, that's what I got out of your experience and your story is that that's where you connected. And we all, a lot of us talk about, you know, meeting a soulmate. How will we know when we're in love? What's a soulmate? Mm -hmm. What's that experience like? Mm -hmm. And I always looked at it as you both are each other's soulmates and that's all fine, well and good but the relationship still has to be tended to. So oh, for you, yeah. And so for mm -hmm. you to be able to, at a certain point, put David's needs above your physical needs, that to me was the greatest act of love and allowed this person, now Deborah, to be the happiest she can be. And it actually worked out that mm -hmm. you have you've evolved to another level of the relationship and you are kindred spirits together going through life, mm -hmm. helping each other. You know, Judy, I, I realized that during the transition and, you know, early on in this whole situation that with some self-satisfaction, a great deal of self-satisfaction, and I don't mean that in an egotistical way. I mean that I realized that I had arrived at a point in my life as a human being, as a soul-centered person, loving person, that I wanted my mate's happiness as, what, as much as I wanted my own. But again, that's why I emphasized that I also said until I decided, I don't know what this will mean for us. I could not... It, it, well, let me give you an example. We spent some time this past summer with another trans couple and that husband, and it's another surgeon who would like more than anything to transition and, and be a woman full time. And one of the things his wife said is, I am not Leslie Fabian. I am not, I cannot support it. You know, if this happens, it's the end of our marriage. Well, and I think it, for me, it's, a, it's about my strength and my ability to say, I don't know what it will mean for us. And my willingness to, you know, I'd been through a divorce before. And I'll tell you something else, Judy. In my life, I've had such examples of deep love and commitment and uh, devotion, as well as such tragedies that it puts things in perspective for me. I mean, early on, before we were married, maybe even before David had left that first wife, he would say to me, I can't believe you're okay with this. And the fact is, Judy, I've had two siblings who've committed suicides, who's, who've completed suicides. And one of them actually happened um, just months before I met David dressed as Deborah. And so I was in a pretty tender very sad space dealing with my sister's suicide. And whenever David would say to me, I can't believe you're okay with this cross-dressing stuff. My reply was, you know what people in my family do when they're unhappy? If it makes you happy to put on a dress, put on a dress. And that's my perspective, Judy. And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is, and I don't know, maybe I'm just saying this because it, to let other people off the hook. I've been through so much that I have a perspective that a lot of people perhaps don't have. When I was three years old and I had a seven-year-old brother, a five-year-old sister, and a two-year-old brother, so four little kids back in the baby boomer years, right after the, shortly after the war, my mother had polio. She was 29 and she had four little kids, seven and well, under the age of eight. And she nearly died. She spent I think it was six weeks in an iron lung. This always makes me cry because I, my father kept a journal and he wrote about how he sat by her head when she was in the iron lung and said, Edie and Jack forever. I love you. 
we're, we'll always be together. And those kinds of things, I know, it's like, what? And, no, and I'm going to cry now. Judy, he gave up his naval career. She ended up in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. So she was 29 when that happened, and she lived to 80, which is pretty amazing considering yeah. her comprom- com- compromised system. Right. But she never walked again other than in the early years when dad would put her in um, – braces and crutches. But anyway, my dad was an Annapolis graduate and he gave up his naval career because he couldn't be off at sea for six months um, and leave a wife in a wheelchair with four little kids. So he resigned from the Navy and I think he was in training for CIA or something. He was learning, he'd learned to speak Hebrew or not Hebrew, I'm sorry. Um, Anyway, he was learning foreign languages and uh they moved back to Tampa, which was his hometown, because my mom needed the warmth. And that's where I grew up. But the example of, I mean, my father just simply adored my mother, and it was completely mutual. So to have had that experience of growing up in a family where I had a father just so devoted to his wife who couldn't walk, uh, and the things that he did to take care of her. And then Oh, there's so, there's more, Judy. I mean, my dad developed Alzheimer's in about his, I mean, it really started showing up in about his mid-60s. And my mother had such patience and kindness and gentleness with my father that I had these this incredible example, right, in my very own parents of extreme devotion, loving and support, mutual support, and just, you know, so... Part of my thinking about that relative to David and Deborah is that David didn't choose to be born wishing he were a girl. Right. This little boy, you know, out on the playground who watched the girls play kickball in their dresses and wanted to be one of them, you know? And my mother didn't choose polio and et cetera, et cetera. It, so, you know, and so with the, I think the combination of that example of loving devotion and care And then losing two of my precious siblings, you know, my brother was only 22 and my sister was 39, you know, to, so to have losses like that. And I do have one more brother. I'm happy to say, um, say again. No, yay. (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. Well, he and I are a lot alike. We're the, the two fighting, Yeah. (laughs) the fighters, you know, the, the war, the spiritual warriors, I guess you could say. He, and well, in fact, he was a literal warrior. He also went to the Naval Academy and was a jet fighter pilot and the air boss on the Nimitz. So, <laughs> well, Leslie, I mean, the courage that it took on your end, and 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 the um, the awareness that it took on your end to say, you must do what makes you happy. I cannot guarantee where I'll be, how I'll be, how how I can hang in there if I can. But I am supportive of you doing what you need to be happy. As opposed to, and this is very fair, the other couple you were talking about where she just couldn't. And she's clear about that too. Yeah. I mean, the clarity. Yeah. Is very important. And, And that's fine too. And so they will have to resolve if they haven't already you know, do they stay in the marriage or do they not? Uh, so, you know, there's no cookie cutter way for anybody, but, but your story mm-hmm. I think is extremely important to come forward. Um, not only through your book and we're going to give um, our listeners the name again, it'll be in the show <laughs> notes and a way for them to get the book. I'll do that in a second. Mm-hmm. But to wrap this up for me, what I came away with learning about you and Deborah and how this has been working is that isn't this the ultimate in a relationship to be able to be supportive of the growth of both of you individually and as a couple and the honesty that you both had with each other You to say, don't know what this means for me, but you've got to do what you've got to do. I'm here now. We'll see how long I can stay here. And then for Deborah then to say before becoming, uh, for David to say before becoming Deborah, but I don't want to lose you. I mean, so there, so all of the work that you both did um, learning about how to, how to foster 
a healthy relationship really came into play at this very pivotal point in your marriage. Mm -hmm. And here you are today. It it, it worked in your favor. Yep. Ten years later. (laughs) Yeah. And then when I saw Deborah the other day, as we were putting, you know, our our little pre-interview together, my, I, I can see the growth in this relationship because you both stopped in my office back in 2016 when you were in town in Los Angeles for that film premiere. Um, And it was great to see you and meet you in person and and meet Deborah in person. But what I saw the other day was the maturity Hmm. of that relationship. You have really come a long way even from that, from Mm -hmm. that point in 2016. And it was just, it just warmed my heart. So that's why I was so excited to really get this interview done and to get you and your story and Deborah's story out there. So with that in mind, the title of the book is My Husband's a Woman Now. And I remember the day we were talking and that was the title that was decided on. So I love it. And you've sold lots of copies of this book. How can people get it? Well, it's not available in bookstores, but it's available through Amazon and Barnes and Noble online or from the publisher, which is Virtual Bookworm. Okay. And I'd also like to mention the subtitle, Judy. It's A Shared Journey of Transition and Love. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. A shared that's what it is. I mean, life is a journey. I, I, that's kind of a trite statement because we hear it all the time, but um it's but it journey. is. But this book started out as your expression. You're telling, explaining what it was like being part of a relationship where one person was significantly changing. And, you may and that, not remember the. Uh, sorry, Judy. The, my working title was "It's My Transition Too." Yes. Because one of the things that I noticed early on when when David began telling people was that for the most part, they were thrilled and excited and totally supportive and encouraging. And there I was in grief. I I guess I want to make a point about that. It would be the same thing you made uh, the comparison earlier, Judy, uh, to a couple where one or the other of them has a car accident, or I immediately thought of Christopher Reeves and that horrible accident he had on his horse and was, couldn't, he was a, quadriplegic. My mother was a paraplegic. And uh, I just think about uh, those connections and how important they are. And uh, anyway, now, I'm, I'm on a tangent here. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm really glad you brought this up. This is important. And I'm sorry I didn't think about it okay. um, what, in questions. But yes, even though you were supportive of Deborah's life going forward as Deborah, you were grieving the loss of that traditional marriage at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the physical intimacy that you loved and had and not so much anymore. Right. So, yes, you had your own journey. Oh, definitely. And you were journaling and then decided to make it into book form, correct? Well, I actually had always thought since meeting David slash Deborah that it would make a great story, just even the cross-dressing part. And so then when uh, it turned into transitioning, I wanted to, I wanted to, well, it, it was that I'd been journaling at that point for probably 30 years or more, but I realized that, and, and I journal in part because it helps me work through things in my life. It's just a wonderful tool Uh, I just wrote a long thing this morning that I read to Deb because we had a little tiff about something yesterday and I learned a lot about myself from that. Um, And um, so I'd always wanted to write about it. And then when the the journey, the the transition was in process, I realized, okay, a journal, a couple pages a day in a journal is not going to hold this story. And I wanted to take the opportunity to inform and entertain. And I am a couples therapist, or I was, I'm retired now. Um, but I love working with couples. And I, we, 
we've worked so hard at this relationship, Judy. If by telling people about it, I can help other couples or individuals, maybe it's individuals who are divorcing or who are thinking about it and, and who realize what might be missing from their relationship and how they might be able to create it. Uh, and also maybe as an example of dealing with a, a type of adversity that, again, it's, it's so, it's a paradox. I love a little Zen saying that it, it is, that says, if it's not paradoxical, it's not true. <laughs> Life is so full of paradox. So that paradox of my wanting David to become Deborah for her happiness at the same time, I wanted to be happy. And if I realized, no, I'm, you know, as my friend does, I want to be married to a man. That's really my preference, Judy. And and Deborah knows that, but it's like, but my primary preference or my choice is to be with her. So... I know. Um, By the way, and I'm sorry I don't know this, do you still have the blog? Oh, you know, I just never did it, Judy. So, uh, no, I don't. I do have a website. um, What is that? uh, It's uh, www.lesliefab.com. Okay. Um, if people they can want- find me, I mean, we, as I said earlier, I know we need to wrap up, but uh, we've had a discrimination lawsuit and we've spoken together and individually about our relationship and this whole transgender phenomenon many times. So if you Google either Deborah or Leslie Fabian, you'll, people can find out whatever they want practically okay. way more than they want anyway. All right. <laughs> um, but you're not taking phone calls. You're not seeing people. You're not doing any of that. Right. If um, if someone contacts me through the website, there's a way to contact me by going to lesliefab.com. Uh, then I will get back to them. And I am more than happy to work with people on the phone if they're in a different location or, you know, I, I do some life coaching and I'm a certified spiritual guide. Deb and I both are. That's something else we've done together recently. We did right. a two two year course in becoming spiritual guides. <laughs> well, you have certainly... Uh, presented one of the best stories, one of the best relationship experiences that I could imagine. And I really thank you for coming on the program. You've been wonderful. I, I'm so happy that I've gotten to know you over the years too, and that we've stayed in touch. So thank so you. So am I, Judy. <laughs> it's been my pleasure to talk with you. And I hope, you know, my fervent hope is that it might be inspiring to some other people in one way or another. There's no way it can't be, Leslie. Thank you again. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Thank all of you for listening. I appreciate you. This podcast is designed to help you in any way it can, either going through an amicable divorce and breakup um, or some insights on staying together. I kind of dabble in, in that area too because people are not always sure that they should get divorced. They just see it as their only option. Mm -hmm. So I hope you've gotten a lot out of this. You can reach me through my website for the podcast, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 